Ahí estamos en vivo por YouTube. Sí, ya estoy... Ah, ya estoy emitiendo. Estoy probando. Ah, vale, pero ya te, o sea, te deja, digamos, ¿no? O sea, uh -huh. que no importa, ¿no? Me redirigió y en este momento yo estoy ya en, en el canal. En vivo. Uh -huh. Ya, entonces tú... Tan... Vale, entonces tú posteas eso, ya le perfecto, ya está. ¿Postea igual el link de Zoom o no? Eh, es que si ya estamos en vivo en YouTube, ¿para qué? Uh -huh. Vale, ahora déjenme escuchar a ver lo que me dice Mónica, en un segundo. Todavía no dejo ingresar gente, ¿cierto? No, yo creo que no. Yo, yo partiría unos 10 minutos antes de, de esta cosa. En todo caso, estamos listos. ¿eh? Estamos conectados, estamos, estamos viendo. ¿Aló? ¿A dónde? Elías, eso, dime, ¿se escucha sonido en, en YouTube o no? Dame un momento, lo veo al tiro. Eh, ya le dije ya a Mónica que no cambiara ninguna contraseña, que no cambiara nada. Uh -huh. No hay problema. Y a mí el computador no me deja, o sea, me dice que no lo reconoce nomás y ya está. Uh -huh. Ya, a ver, yo por lo menos no tengo problema, si yo en este momento estoy transmitiendo sin ningún, ningún problema por YouTube. Así que, si quieren, nos quedamos con esto. Yo después me, yo voy a seguir siendo Ponte el anfitrión. No sé si te incomoda eso. Ah, no. Entonces, tú, José, ¿tú? se escucha perfecto por YouTube. Estamos Bacán. en este momento en vivo por YouTube. Bacán, súper. Ya tenemos dos espectadores. Ya. Entonces, eh, eh, José Luis. Estimado. Eh, me, me gustaría que pudieras colocar eh, alguna, mmm, no sé si sí. tiene alguna diapositiva improvisada. Eh, no, pero la hago enseguida, ¿vale? Eh, coloca esperando, eh, no, esperando eh, reunión, colocar el título, la cosa, ¿no? Uh -huh. y, está por YouTube, y te colocas en silencio para, para que... Sí. Cual, cualquier cosa, tengo el WhatsApp abierto, cualquier cosa, Elías, porfa, lo mismo, ¿vale? Vale, eh, vale. Cualquier cosa, pues voy a estar como yo al pendiente de todo, ¿ya? Claro, estoy esperando, en realidad ahorita estoy en, en, el, en el sitio web y normalmente yo podría entrar al correo también desde el sitio web, pero, pero me lleva de nuevo a la página donde quiere decir que soy yo y aunque yo pongo la clave a mí también me pone que la contraseña eh, no es correcta si en tu computador eh, en tu computador no está funcionando tampoco, o sé sea, y, y verifica que en tu computador cuando estás intentando entrar a una cuenta, efectivamente estés queriendo entrar a la de admin .org, en lugar de que estés tratando de entrar a la, a la cuenta José Pinto José, 945-950, ¿damos ingreso? Sí, 9... No, no, espérate, yo le dije a Dan Gold que entrara a las 945. Ya. Yeah. 9.45. Oye, yo me voy a silenciar por cualquier cosa, ¿eh? yo prefiero estar como al pendiente de todo lo que pueda estar ocurriendo, ¿vale? Comuniquémonos por WhatsApp, ¿vale? Ningún problema. Vale, entonces silenciate. Y... Uh -huh. que estoy haciendo la diapo. Ya. ¿Te iniciaste, no? Eh, sí, ya la hice. Espera un poquitito. Ahora sí, sí, sí. sí tranquilo, papá. Tranquilo, perrín. Lo bueno es que si se le cae, no se le cae al otro José. <risa> a uno de los dos José se nos va a caer. <risa> ya, voy a compartir pantalla. La, la, la misma día por ocupé, así que para que no te, no te, no te preocupes. Ahí estamos, ¿vale? Ya, lo voy a colocar en inglés, si no me quiero pedir. Ok.
Me voy a silenciar un segundo. José Luis, debería colocarlo una 4501, 2.45 GMT. Eh, uh, ya, dime cuánto. 0145. 45. Uno, dos puntitos. 45 GMT. ¿Ya? ya. Listo, estoy arreglándolo. Espérame ahí un poquitito. Una vez eh, tenga todo listo, José Luis, voy a compartir el link al. Ni un problema, compadre. Ni un problema, compadre. Entonces, déjame arreglar un poquito la letra. Estamos perfecto. Ah, la wea. Colócate en silencio, José Luis. Baf, baf. Vení nervioso. Eso, ya, ahora. No es por nada. Coño, es que no cuesta nada. Joder. Desobediente. A todos les he puesto como un, o sea, como una, como un puesto, es decir, eh, moderador, coordinador.
José Luis, eh, te voy a pedir que puedas, no sé si me estás escuchando, levanta la mano si me escuchas. Sí, vale. Eh, no sé si puedes revisar si ya está Dan Gold y Nicolás, ¿ya? Eh, Nicolás Hack, ¿ya? Eh, y recibe también a Eloisa y Erika, que seguramente deben estar esperando. Eh, lo mismo que, eh, bueno, la gente de soporte, ¿no? José Luis, ¿puedes hacerlo? Si quieres lo hago yo. Yo puedo verlo acá. Ah, eso, hazme, hazme a mí con anfitrión. También. Elías. ¿Cómo? Eh, José Luis, hazme a, eh, digamos, con anfitrión a mí también. Vale. Entonces, Gracias, 31 esperando. Eh, sí, a ver, déjame ver. Eloisa, a ver, espérate, admitir a Eloisa. Ya, estoy metiendo a Eloisa. Erika Celis, también admitir. Eh, Brigitte. Honor Selic. También invité al doctor Honor Selic. Bueno, se me pasó. Lo siento. Eh, ahora a Nicolás, aquí está Nicolás. Ya. Eh, José Luis, tú que puedas dejar de compartir pantalla. ¿Vale? Y vámonos a galería ahora. Ok. Vamos a. Uh, Nicolás uh, le di el audio a Nicolás uh, a ver le falta hello how are you good how are you Eloisa uh, algo pasa con tu fondo de pantalla te doy el audio Eloisa, algo pasa con tu fondo de pantalla. Nicolás, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Good. <laughs> nice to meet you. But nice to I, meet you too. I can see you. Okay. Oh, hold on. I am looking for nice. Hello. Uh, hello. Nick, hello. Uh, I am looking for uh for dan and i i i i can't find in the waiting room i don't know okay okay but uh, we are transmitting right now uh in the um, in youtube channel okay okay are, okay that's right so we need to wait a little bit i don't know if um if um if dan explained you uh about mm -hmm. uh, about uh, which is uh, our inauguration format. Did he explain a little bit something? Okay. Well, I'm going to explain you a little bit. That's why I request that you come here, you stay here in advance. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, we are going to have a, a very small inauguration uh, time. It means, um, we are going to have uh, the possibility to explain about how born this uh, course. Uh, after I'm going to present my people, the people involved in this area. And after that, uh, Dan is going to talk about uh, speakers, okay? Uh, okay. His, his team, okay? Um, okay? Okay, let me, uh, we are fixing the last, the latest things. So please, um, uh, uh, okay. So that is the idea. Okay. Okay. This is your your university. Yeah. Your your hospital. My hospital. Oh yes, nice, nice. So big. <laughs> it's in the middle of Chicago. So. Okay, but we are 
in a, in a space bigger than your your hospital because we are in the universe. Can't you look mm. look at? <laughs> <laughs> we always find things to, 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 to laugh a little bit. Okay, that's right. Okay. I am looking for Dan. I can't see him. I can't see him. Uh, uh, Elias, can if you like. You can see Dan, Dan Gold. Uh, here, here is. Okay, here is. Because we, we want to have a, at least a few minutes in order to, to fix everything, okay? Sure. And trying to meet people right now, but um, the idea, the idea is, um, hello Dan, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, here, here, we are well, very well. Everything is fixing. We are transmitting right now in Great. YouTube channel. I just explained a little bit, uh, Nicolas, about uh, which is going to be our inauguration uh, time. Is uh, it means uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, about how to born this course. After that, uh, I'm going to introduce you, okay? Uh, well, first, I'm going to introduce you, okay? You can speak a little bit about yourself and everything. Great. After, I'm going to share my screen, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about the, the team of Geno, the TAM group. And after, I'm going to give you the word in order you can uh, introduce uh, your people, okay? That okay. Okay, so can you share your screen a little bit in order we can prove everything working okay? Absolutely. Do you want uh, Nick to share or do you want me to share? Uh, sorry, uh, can you share? So yep. I believe you can share without any problem, okay? Yes. That's, I'm going to also my... Uh, Jose Luis Anabalón. Eh, para transmitir por YouTube, eh, tienes que colocarte tu volumen lo más alto que se pueda. Okay. We are going to talk uh, a mixture between Spanish and, and English. Okay. So um, uh, the idea, yes, the idea is to encourage you, Nicolas and Dan, to learn Spanish. Okay. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, not... I, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you if you want to practice, uh, we are available. Okay. No? <laughs> <laughs> the idea is to to enjoy learning. Okay, we enjoy a lot without uh, I don't know in whatever opportunity we have. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Let me. I'm just working on a, another virtual background here. I feel like I'm not. Let Hop, me. Hopkins let, is not visible enough behind me here. Okay, but it's no problem. Okay, we we can realize that uh, you are from uh, the Hopkins. Okay, uh, give me a few minutes, a few seconds to share my screen. I'm going to share my Great. screen in order everything is working. Okay, okay. Let me see. Okay, can you see my screen or not? Yes. My general Adam group. Yep. Let me see. Okay, uh, here. Okay. Okay, it's working okay. Can you see my presentation right now? Yes. Okay, that's right. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, sharing in order you can share your screen. Um, okay. Okay, that's right. Appear Jeff Hopkins Hospital. It's Is that better? Like, but it looks like the emergency room. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Nick, Nick made me feel bad. My background wasn't good enough, so. <laughs> but sorry, you have depression looking at this. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so I'll, I can share my slides. Um, nice. All right, so I just had just four quick ones here. Okay. I'm just gonna talk about me and my mentors Okay, nice. And then I was going to talk about Nick and his mentors. Oh, yes. Very briefly. And all, all roads sort of lead back to David Z. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I was going to talk, Jose, about, about you and I and sort of um, where this, this idea came from. Oh, yes. Nice. And then, and then, so I guess my question is, where will these live? Where will the handout and the lecture live? Is it okay to, to mention 
my collection as as one way to access this or or what would you prefer yes yes i do believe uh, uh, after after the meeting we can talk a little bit for example we are going to promote your your this thing your your uh, page the novel Utah. Uh, we always when we recommend for example uh, someone need a video or something like this we uh, share this uh, this is a link noveluta.edu.gov. Okay. Okay. So people know you are you are you are link. Okay, it's no problem. So we need to promote this thing. Okay. The idea is uh, to increase uh, the knowledge of people in your uh, in your link. Okay, that is the idea. Okay. okay, so so should I keep this slide and just mention that this is one place where these documents will live? Of course, or... of course. Okay. You can, you can, when you talk, can you you can request people can um, uh, make uh, uh, shots on the screen, okay? But or you can mention we are going to to share uh, the the link after the meeting. Okay, it's no problem. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, that's right. Okay, I do believe uh, we are ready. Uh, please uh, admit uh, all the people. Okay, uh, that there are they are at the waiting room. Uh, I don't know if uh, Doctor Onur Selik is uh, is available yet, but uh, he is here. You can see in the because uh, he is a very close friend of us. And uh, I want to introduce you, but I don't know if he is still uh, is. Um, no, is I am here. Available to talk, Professor Onur, Can you open your video? Because I like to introduce you to our team uh, and to Dan Gold and to Professor Nicholas Hack. Uh, if you want, if you can, it will be very. Yeah, nice. uh, I'm here. Okay. Is, uh, he's helping us uh, a lot because he's sharing the information of the course uh, in the group uh, for, uh, with a lot of people. So we are very happy, Onur, uh, you can Thank join you. the meeting. Okay, we are sharing all of this meeting right now uh, in YouTube channel. Okay, even we have uh, uh, now prepared everything for the integration of the course. Okay. Can you introduce a little bit yourself, Professor Anur? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Turkey. Uh, I work as an ENT professor in a university hospital near Izmir, which is located in the western part of the country, very close to Greece. Uh, I'm a bit older than you all. Uh, but I'm specifically interested in otology and neurotology, uh, and very much interested in vestibular disorders and physiology also. So I'm happy to be here and see you all here. And I hope to uh, have a, a good lecture here. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Okay. Uh, we have uh, about uh, two minutes to start and uh, form our parts of the meeting. And um, I'd like to let you know, uh, especially Nicolas, yeah, that is new here, uh, that we are a group uh, uh, not only for sharing information in neurotology, we work for unity between professionals around the world. That is the key of genome, that is the difference, okay? We promote strongly their relationships between professionals. That's why we always have three parts of each meeting because we are in study groups. We are not a group for lectures. We are in study group. So we promote the, the interchange and relationship between people. Someone uh, has the microphone. I'm going to silence everyone. And uh, I'm going to uh, give the the audio only for the people who is going to talk. Uh, I'm going to give you Dan the audio and Nicolas also the audio. 
Okay, please activate it. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about uh, we are um, a group for established relationships between professionals. And uh, the idea is uh, to work together, to, go, to work as a team. Okay, that is the idea. Okay, I do believe we are on time. No, and uh, we have uh, two, two minutes. I'm going to fling much more a little bit. So uh, I was explaining we have three parts of each meeting. It means uh, we have an informal part, okay? And that is the informal part. Uh, after when on, we are on time, starting the formal part. And right today we are going to talk about the inauguration, the opening lectures, okay? And after, um, we are going to uh, have uh, time for questions and doubts. That is a formal part too. And after we finish and we restart an informal part where people sharing each other, okay? That is the idea. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit in Spanish, okay? Before starting, uh, Jose Luis, um, quiero saber si ya está listo, preparado para la, um, eh, para transmitir, digamos, Ábreme, el, por favor, el audio. Eh, José Luis Anabalón. Vale. Hola. Quiero saber para poder transmitir ya en YouTube, ¿no? Sí, está todo listo. Todo funcionando, estamos correctos, así que solo esperamos la presentación. Vale, perfecto. Bueno. Ok. Bueno, well, we are on time. It's uh, 10 a.m. Um, Chilean hour, GMT, uh, minus four. And East Coast hour, so we are going to... To, to start with the, with the meeting, okay? Uh, first of all, I like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Dan Gold in order um, all the people know that uh, this course uh, has been prepared uh, as a team with uh, Dr. Dan Gold and his team. Uh, probably all of you know that Dr. Dan Gold because he uh, gave us a lectures about uh, two months uh, ago. And after the lectures, we uh, start with this idea that we start today. Please, Dan, uh, I'm going to give you the word in order you can talk a little bit about you. After, I'm going to share my screen. And after that, I'm going to, sh to give you the possibility to share your screen to talk uh, um, a little bit about uh, this idea and also the team uh, is going to participate in this course. Uh, please, uh, Dan. Great, thanks so much. Um, and it's an honor to be here, to be invited to, to collaborate with your society um, on this course, on this series of lectures. And um, <laughs> learning Spanish is on my to-do list. So um, one day <laughs> it, it'll happen. Um, so right now, as you can see, I'm sitting out on the street in front of the Johns Hopkins Hospital and uh, very excited to, to be giving this lecture. So I just have, um, or to be introducing this lecture and this, this lecture series, I should say. So um, just a couple slides I wanted to share about sort of where this came from. All right, so this is where I am. I'm at Johns Hopkins in Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, my mentors, uh, so Dr. David Newman-Toker, so the first patient with the acute vestibular syndrome um, where the HINTS exam was applicable. And the first time I read about this HINTS exam, that's really what sort of won me over and, and made me interested in the field of eye movements and vestibular um, Dr. David Newman-Toker, uh, fortunately, is, is one of my current mentors and bosses. Dr. David Z, the guy who wrote the Neurology of Eye Movements book. I was then introduced to him as a neurology resident, and, um, and that was it. I knew that this, this was the path for me. So again, now I'm fortunate enough um, to, to be mentored um, by both of these excellent neurologists, vestibular neurologists, neurotologists, otoneurologists, whatever you want to call them. Dr. David Newman-Toker was also trained by Dr. Z. And what about Dr. Nick Hack? So he's in Chicago, Illinois, and his mentors are Dr. Tim Hain, Northwestern University. He's at Northwestern, fingers crossed, maybe he'll, 
He'll be with us for at least a year at Johns Hopkins next year, but we'll see. Um, Dr. Churchy as well as one of his mentors at, at Northwestern. And not surprisingly, Dr. David Z makes another appearance here at Johns Hopkins. He trained Dr. Hain. Dr. Hain trained Dr. Churchy. And now these are um, Dr. Hack's mentors. So again, all of these roads sort of lead back to, to Dr. David Z um, for neurologi neurologists who have an interest in the vestibular system or eye movements in the United States and all over the world. So how did we get here? So um, I, I was in Chile a couple years ago. I gave talks. I met Jose. Um, we exchanged some emails over the years. Last year, I was in Brasilia. This year, this week, I would have been in Sao Paulo um, for my third consecutive trip to South America in three years, which, which I was very much looking forward to. And then something happened. Um, Jose and I came together, exchanged some ideas, um, thought about kind of what, what is lacking um, with regard to training of ENTs and neurologists who are interested in the world of vestibular neurology. And, and this is how the, the idea for this course came about. So just to let you know, um, through my, my collection, the North American Neuroophthalmology Society, this virtual education okay, library, okay. What, what we're going to do, um, this is going to be one place where these lectures, links to the lectures will live, um, as well as the handouts. So all of the speakers will, will um, create a sort of one to two page document, a handout to accompany the lecture with additional reading and sort of, um, I think that'll be a nice supplement to this lecture series. So questions, concerns, if you like the course, email me. If you don't like the course, email me. And um, this, is, this is our first attempt at this. So we are very much open to ideas. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it useful. And it is an honor for, for me to be collaborating with, with your society. Thank you so much. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hack, who's an excellent neurologist at the Northwestern um, University in Chicago. As I said, and let me unshare here. And um, again, he's doing an excellent job. He just started as a neurologist at Northwestern and he already knows 150% um, more about the vestibular system than any other neurologist, but uh, hopefully he will choose to do his, his ocular motor and otoneurology fellowship with us next year at, at Johns Hopkins. And, um, and he's, he's excellent, no doubt in my mind that he will soon be one of the leaders in the field. So um, without further ado, I'd like to, to, to let Dr. Hack take over, um, or at least his lecture. Sorry, Jose, I'm not sure which of those is, is going to happen first. Thank you very much, Dan, and welcome. Uh, and we are, we are very happy to start with this course, very, very happy. Uh, I do believe uh, uh, this is a new time in our group. Um, I like to say thanks for you, to your effort, and also for Nicolas to prepare everything. Okay, I'm going to share the screen in order to talk a little bit about uh, our group and what we are doing and how it's born, okay? Um, that is the idea of, uh, I don't know if you can share my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, it's working, okay, that's right. Okay, well, uh, as a matter of fact, Geno Group is a, born, is a group that born about three years ago with a very small group with eight people, but right now we are over 900 people, okay? After COVID time, we grow a lot. We have uh, today the possibility to, to start with this course because uh, we talk uh, after the lectures of Dan Gold about three months ago to talk about how uh, he can help our group because we talk about, about uh, an article, a very famous article about ocular pill reaction and I explained to him that for us it's very difficult because of the language and also because this topic is very difficult to learn. So how uh, we, we, show, we, we see different possibilities to, uh, to learn this thing and he offered us the possibility to uh, start with this course. So that's why we are very happy because uh, after a preparing of uh, a couple of months, we designed this very, very interesting uh, course um, 
that was organized uh, by uh, Daniel Gold. Okay, so we want to to say thanks to to the people of uh, General Latin Group who works very hard to prepare everything. Uh, in the area of the web page, uh, we need to say thanks to Dr. Monica uh, Davila. She is an ENT from Costa Rica. Also, uh, Dr. Marian Fuentes prepared everything about uh, uh, about uh, uh, subtitles. Uh, we need to say thanks also to Dr. Erika Celis and Dr. Eloisa Toledo. Then they are from Mexico and she is going to be and to became the moderators of our lectures. And finally, we need to say thanks uh, to uh, Jose Luis Navalón and Elias Villagran. All of them are medical technicians from Chile. And that's why we, uh, we do this uh, thing. Uh, we do this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, special, special um, uh, uh, course. And uh, right now we are going to inaugurate formally this, this course, okay? So we are going to start uh, sharing uh, the video, uh, the simultaneous video, okay? Uh, Jose Luis, please uh, uh, start the, the sharing, the, your, the video, okay? Uh, we have, we prepare this, uh, this video with subtitles in Spanish in order uh, people can understand better the information, okay? Please uh, go ahead, uh, Jose Luis, uh, activate your audio, please, in order uh, okay. we okay. Uh, keep our communication, okay? Thank you very much for, for everything. Uh, Daniel, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit before start video or uh, Nicolas can talk a little bit uh, before start the video. I'm giving you the audio. I don't know, uh, but uh, uh, any comments or something like this. I don't have too much to say. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Okay, uh, Jose Luis, please start uh, sharing uh, everything. Okay, wait a moment, please. I'm started for this. I guess while we're waiting for that to happen, I would just say that the first two lectures are just to sort of to lay the groundwork um, to sort of build the foundation for the, the future lectures, which will be a little bit more specific to, to the central vestibular pathology and disorders and how to examine the patient. Um, these, two pa the, these two lectures, so this is the vestibular system anatomy and physiology, obviously with more emphasis on the central vestibular system um, but you have to, to start somewhere. You have to talk about the peripheral vestibular system and the, and the anatomy and physiology a little bit as well. Um, so the next talk will be ocular motor. And again, then the bedside exam, how to examine these patients, what's normal, what's not normal. And then we'll sort of really get into the nitty gritty to the specifics. Okay. okay. I'm ready. Yes, podemos verlo. Um, please. Uh... Uh, add the subtitles in uh, in Spanish, okay? Okay, está ready. Debería funcionar, okay. Comenzamos. Okay, okay. go ahead, please. Thank you, Dan. Hello, and welcome to the first lecture in the CNS Vestibular Disorders course. My name is Dr. Nick Hatch. Um, I am a neurologist here at Northwestern in Chicago, um, and I am undergoing special training in um, otoneurology. So to kick off this series, um, Dan Gold has asked me to uh, do the vestibular anatomy and physiology lecture. This is kind of our roadmap for today. 
of course, uh, my understanding is that a lot of the audience here is probably going to be ENT physicians or otolaryngologists who may deal more with kind of the peripheral disorders of the nervous system. And while I am going to talk a little bit about that, I'm going to talk about the vestibular system in general and not just the peripheral lesions, but kind of go over some of the problems of the central nervous system too. Because this entire lecture series has a devoted lecture to each of the parts of the central nervous system and how these can lead to vestibular disorders, this is really meant as more of an overview, if anything. Now, coming from the perspective of neurologists, we have a little bit of a different way of thinking about the vestibular nervous system. We have a tendency to take the history and physical and try to localize the lesion to figure out um, where the problem could be, what physiology is affected, and then as a result from that, what could the etiology of the problem be? And so if we develop a good understanding of what the anatomy of the vestibular system is and how it works, then it makes it significantly easier for us to localize the lesion and figure out what's going on. So here is kind of the basics of the vestibular system and where most people will have uh, problems um, or lesions in these areas that can then lead to dizziness, imbalance, or other uh, complaints that are related to a misperception of motion. We see here is the labyrinth, which is in the inner ear, the vestibular nerve that transmits the information from the labyrinth into the central nervous system. The vestibular nuclei, of course, are where the uh, vestibular nerve itself does end up going. And that's, of course, low, and those are, of course, located within the brain stem itself, which is a very important part of the central nervous system, both for transmitting information as well as is integral in um, modifying the information that it receives. The cerebellum, which interacts closely with the vestibular nuclei and the vestibular information to further integrate and modify this information for more fine tuning. And then the information is, of course, transmitted up through the brainstem into the thalamus, which is the relay center for the rest of the brain. Finally, we have the basal ganglia which is also a modifier of information, if you will, uh, particularly with information from the uh, brainstem itself as well as the thalamus. And then we've got the vestibular cortex, um, which is of course the area where we have kind of an understanding of uh, where, we get, where we get the information from the vestibular to develop a better understanding of where we are in space and things along those lines. All of this together helps us detect our position in space. It helps coordinate our posture and our position of our head and neck. And of course, it helps coordinate the eye movements. And this last part becomes particularly relevant, especially clinically, because the eye movements end up being a huge part of the physical exam that gives us hints as to where in the vestibular system, the problem could be when people come into the clinic complaining of dizziness or imbalance. This is a little bit of the overview. I've kind of divided this talk into five separate general categories. Traditionally, these first two categories of the labyrinth and the vestibular nerve are considered the peripheral nervous system. I will, of course, mentioned some caveats to this, by the way, where while these might traditionally be considered the peripheral nervous system, you can get central nervous system disorders that will affect these. And then of course, the second group is more 
traditionally considered the central nervous system, where if somebody comes in complaining of a problem of the vestibular system or dizziness, that they that when someone says that they have a problem with the central nervous system, this is where the problem might be located, is in one of these uh, areas here. So let's start off with the labyrinth. The labyrinth, of course, located in the inner ear, within the mastoid, is the primary organ that is responsible for uh, detecting um, motion. The labyrinth, of course, comes in two parts, the semicircular canals and the otolithic organs. Just starting with the semicircular canals themselves, these are what detect angular acceleration. Um, there's basically three of them that are located approximately orthogonally in either ear. And the reason why this is important is because if you have it in all three dimensions, then the, each of these semicircular canals can then detect angular acceleration as one moves their head in various directions, such as this, this, or this. So even when I'm moving my head that way, it, it is essentially the semicircular canals that help detect where I am in space and how my head is moving. The idea is that there is an endolymph within these semicircular canals, which essentially stays in place. And when the canals themselves, which are attached to the bone, move around, the endolymph, there's a delay in when it moves. As a result, the inertia from the endolymph itself ends up pushing on the cupula here and either activates or inhibits the hair cells that are located here. Essentially, the effect that this has is that it leads to a difference in what type of signal is moving through the vestibular nerve. And whether or not the signal is increased or decreased is what determines to your central nervous system where you are in space as it relates to angular motion. Next, the otolithic organs. These have a little bit of a different function. Um, these are essentially just the utricle and the saccule that are somewhat curvaceous structures. Uh, uh, even though there's only two of them, because of their curvy nature, they are able to detect uh, linear motion within um, a 3D space. Essentially that the way they work is they have this gelatinous membrane and the otoconia on top of them and this is, of course, where the otoconia are supposed to be located, which when I would turn my head to one side, for example, it leads to the otoconia, which are heavy, to kind of move to the side in the direction that I'm moving in, which then either activates or inhibits the hair cells within the utricle and the saccule. And this tells the body tells the brain what direction my head is moving in so that it can act accordingly. Beyond just detecting gravity as I move my head from one side to another, it also actually just detects uh, linear motion. So if, for example, I'm walking forward, walking to the side, then it'll, it'll know especially from a acceleration standpoint, how quickly it is that I'm moving. This of course leads to some more clinically relevant scenarios, as I'm sure that most of you are aware of BPPV, as I'm sure that many of you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis in clinic. Here we have an example. Um, I took a picture of this <laughs> Uh, with my cell phone um, from Lee and Z's Neurology of Eye Movements, uh, I, which I think is an excellent example of how um, you can get those otoconia, which are supposed to be in the utricle and the saccule, they get displaced and they go into these semicircular canals. 
where they're not supposed to be. When these otoconia are, of course, moving within this endolymphatic fluid, because of the difference in their density, um, as people move their head around in these kind of more angular ways, then the otoconia move and it leads to a difference in signal. Um, and people kind of uh, then start to feel dizzy. One important point from this is that if you look at the type of nystagmus that is produced from this BPPV, from this displacement of the otoconia, you'll notice that uh, depending on the way in which the nystagmus is moving, it actually directly correlates with the plane in which that particular semicircular canal is. And so as we can see in this example image from Li and Z, if you have somebody who has, for example, a um, right posterior canal problem, then they will have this right torsional component um, with a downward displacement of the eyes in the slow phase. We, of course, traditionally um, discuss nystagmus more in terms of the fast phase. Um, and so if that is the convention under which you use, then the, the eye movements are actually the opposite of that, where we see that kind of the fast phase of the eyes is up, and then there's a torsional component that is towards the right ear. One important point is that due to the way in which the semicircular canals are organized, is that if you have somebody who has a pure vertical nystagmus, this, it, that can't really fit with any one individual canal. And so you should think about whether or not this is a central problem. With the caveats that you can have bilateral canals, uh, for example, both posterior canals affected, that can lead to a pure vertical nystagmus. But you should be thinking about a central process first. Secondly, if you have a pure torsional nystagmus without any up beating, down beating, right beating, left beating, then you should also think about a central lesion as the cause for that. Uh, the reason for that is because you would need to have otoconia in both your anterior and posterior canal on one side in order to lead to a perfectly torsional uh, nystagmus. Here's another caveat, is that if you, even though traditionally a lesion of the vestibular nerve or the labyrinth is considered to be a peripheral lesion, you can actually get a stroke of your anterior inferior cerebellar artery, uh, or AICA is how we refer to it. And because it's the AICA that completely supplies the labyrinthine artery, which is the artery that supplies the vestibular nerve and the labyrinth, then what happens is that when you get a stroke there, the blood supply there stops and both the vestibule or labyrinth and cochlea uh, completely stop working. And so people who have a stroke here will get sudden onset um, vertigo, as well as hearing loss. And generally speaking, the hearing loss is substantial. So this is kind of an important thing to think about uh, as a possibility when somebody complains of a sudden onset uh, vertigo, if they have also sudden onset hearing loss that is substantial, you should think about an AICA stroke. another caveat that I want to bring out. Um, if any of you are pediatric ENTs or pediatric um, neurologists, you Okay, we don't, we don't have audio. Jose Luis, please. Uh... However, there's also some literature to suggest that the vestibule or the labyrinth is also damaged in survivors of meningitis. Um, 
in my own personal experience, actually, uh, here at Northwestern, just about, I want to say, eight months ago, we had an adult who came into the emergency department with meningitis. And this particular uh, person, he was complaining, he was cognitively very intact, but he was complaining of uh, hearing loss and vertigo on one side and had no other focal neurological symptoms. Uh, he was febrile and he had no other source for his infection. We did a lumbar puncture on him early and, it, and he had a florid bacterial meningitis. And it was the hearing loss and vertigo that were his, his first symptoms of this. And so, well, we know that um, meningitis can lead to damage in hearing and damage in the labyrinth uh, after somebody has had meningitis, it's likely that this can happen early on in the process of meningitis. Um, it's just that so many of these patients end up coming in with uh, altered cognition. And so maybe we're not always aware of it. So I would encourage those of you to, if you hear that somebody is feeling very sick as a fever with these sorts of symptoms. Just think about meningitis as a possibility. Next, we're moving on to the vestibular nerve itself. Um, also an area that uh, is probably very familiar to you guys. So the vestibular nerve is part of cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve eight is a combination of both the vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve. Um, the cell bodies of each of these nerves are located very close to the cochlea and the labyrinth. And basically, these are the bodies that then put out the bipolar axons that meet with these primary organs and then go to the brain itself. So the course of the nerve itself, um, it joins pretty quickly with the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve before exiting uh, the internal acoustic meatus, um, which is, of course, an opening um, from the mastoid bone into the skull, it's, or into the interior space of the skull itself, I should say. Uh, it traverses the skull in, within the subarachnoid space itself. And it's important to realize, in case anybody has uh, problems with the subarachnoid space, as it's traversing along the bottom of the skull, it then takes a dive down into the area where the brainstem is before entering at the cerebellopontine angle within the pons itself, before synapsing onto the vestibular nuclei. So the reason why I bring up the course, once again, as uh, neurologists, we like to think about the anatomy to figure out where the lesion is. And so one important thing to remember is because uh, this nerve takes a dive through the internal acoustic meatus, you can imagine that there are diseases of the bone itself that can then impinge on the vestibular nerve. For example, osteopetrosis, multiple myeloma, osteosarcoma, if you get somebody who has both a cranial nerve seven and eight palsy, you wanna think about this possibility. One other important thing to realize is that the vestibular nerve is actually separated into a superior and an inferior portion. Generally speaking, the superior portion of that nerve runs closer with the facial nerve and then the inferior portion actually runs with the cochlear nerve. The superior division of the vestibular nerve is the one that transmits the information from the utricle, um, as well as the anterior and lateral canals. And then the inferior portion generally uh, transmits information from the posterior canal as well as the saccule. The reason why this is kind of important is because in vestibular neuritis, uh, which is a very common cause of sudden onset uh, persistent dizziness, is that, 
that the vestib that is that the superior vestibular nerve is the one that's most commonly affected. As a result of that, um, it's especially kind of the lateral canal and anterior canal types of symptoms that these patients often get. Um, to kind of illustrate this, uh, I kind of like and I enjoy looking at this diagram here, uh, kind of a nice example of how the vestibular ocular reflex works. So in a normal person, when my head is still, each of my vestibular uh, nerves are transmitting a constant signal uh, that goes to my eyes to tell them to stay straight ahead. My left ear is pushing my eyes to the right. My right ear is pushing my eyes to the left and they remain approximately equal. But then what happens is based on the vestibular ocular reflex, if I turn my head to the right, then what happens is that the lateral canal within the right ear then forces my vestibular nerve to send an increased frequency of signal to, to my eyes. And then that increased signal forces my eyes to turn in the opposite direction such that my eyes don't move with my head but stay on target with something. And this is kind of illustrated here. As a, I mean, what also happens at the same time, of course, is if I turn my head to the right, then my left ear will send a, a lower frequency signal, which normally would be pushing my eyes in the other direction, but because it's a lower frequency, frequency signal, it's not as strong as a stimulus. One important point to realize is that dual second law demonstrates that excitation is a, better is a better stimulus than inhibition. And so generally speaking, it's that increased frequency signal that is more important for moving the eyes in the vestibular ocular reflex. So in vestibular neuritis, when I suddenly knock out one side, then because now not both my ears are able to send a constant stimulus, and rather one ear is essentially no longer sending a stimulus. The, the lateral canal and vestibular nerve that are on the working side will push your eyes in the opposite direction. And so as a result, uh, you get this slow phase from the working ear for example, if I suppose that I have a left vestibular neuritis, a slow phase from the right ear that will move to the left, and then I'll have a quick phase uh, that'll move to the to the right. That's, that, and if it moves to the right like that, then that's suggestive of a left-sided vestibular neuritis. There's another sort of entity that's kind of important in these, bi in these uh, vestibular neuridities, and that's bilateral vestibulopathy. And this is where people have an impairment of their vestibular function from both sides. Um, there's, a f there's a variety of different causes for this. Of course, one of the most well-known ones is if patients get gentamicin and they can have bilateral vestibular loss about one third of people who have bilateral vestibular loss have this. About half of them, we actually aren't really sure what the cause is. And when you get a decreased signal from both sides of your ears, now you don't have that constant signal um, that is kind of at the normal frequency, but each ear is barely telling you to do anything. And so when I move my head around, you know, my eyes, uh, don't make the appropriate connection. And people complain of this oscillopsia or an unsteadiness where whenever they're moving around, the entire world is bouncing because their, they, their vestibular system just can't detect where they are in space or how they're moving. One easy way to um, look for this as the cause of somebody's symptoms is basically to have you move their head back and forth and then have them try to read 
lines on a Snellen chart. If they're not able to read uh, four lines up from where they normally can read, then that's suggestive that they might have bilateral vestibular loss. Okay, so we've kind of gone through the peripheral um, vestibular lesions and the peripheral vestibular anatomy and physiology a little bit. So let's just move on to the central nervous system. And this is of course going to be the topic of uh, the rest of these lectures. And, if, and the rest of the lectures will go into more detail of how do you recognize disorders here. But I really just want to illustrate and give the roadmap here so that you guys can have a better idea for what exactly it is that we're talking about. So starting with the brainstem and the vestibular nuclei within. So just as a reminder, the midbrain is the top portion of the brainstem connects to the thalamus directly above it. Uh, which subsequently connects the signals to the remaining cortex. The pons is the middle part of the brain stem, and it's where uh, the vestibular nuclei uh, are at their highest level and connects to the cerebellum in the back of the brain. This particular image does not have a cerebellum, but the cerebellum should be located here. The medulla uh, also houses the inferior portions of the vestibular nuclei and connects to the spinal cord below it. Here we have a picture of the vestibular nuclei within the brainstem itself. So just to orient you, we are looking at the back of the brainstem. These areas here are the connections to the cerebellum and back and the cerebellum has been cut off from this image. Up here we have the midbrain, here we have the pons, and here we have the medulla. So the, vest the vestibular nuclei are located here as illustrated in these kind of uh, purplish shapes within the brainstem. Here we have the medial vestibular nucleus, the lateral vestibular nucleus, the superior vestibular nucleus, and the inferior vestibular nucleus. We have several tracts that come out of the vestibular nuclei, and so I just wanted to briefly go over the anatomy of these because it kind of gives an idea of how the vestibular system works um, to send uh, or to coordinate with the body so that, the, so that we know where we are in space. This lateral vestibular tract, which primarily comes from the lateral vestibular nucleus, moves down the medulla and the, um, spinal, and the uh, spinal cord itself to maintain balance and tone. It mostly sends signals to the body itself um, in order to keep the core in the correct place based on what's my uh, vestibular system is detecting is going on in my external environment. The medial vestibulospinal tract, rather than dealing with the body, deals more with the head and neck. And this is primarily coming from um, the medial vestibular nucleus. However, it also receives some information from the lateral vestibular nucleus in order to keep the neck and the head in the appropriate place. And then we have the medial longitudinal fasciculus, uh, of which we commonly refer to as the MLF, which actually extends more superiorly. So while these previous two tracks went down the medulla into the spinal cord, this actually goes up the pons up the, and up into the midbrain even. Uh, this is what's responsible for the vestibulo-ocular reflex that I briefly went over. Um, and we will probably go over in more detail later on in a later lecture, uh, but it does move on to the main cranial nerves that are responsible for eye movements, uh, predominantly three, four, and six. And then finally, there is uh, one tract that I think is important to note, um, but not explicitly illustrated in this particular image is the vestibulo-cerebellar tract. 
the vestibular nuclei here actually move through these uh, peduncles into the cerebellum. And the connection between the two, which does go back and forth, uh, is responsible for the fine tuning of these vestibular signals. So these are four of the main tracks, uh, basically. One is responsible for the balance and tone of the body, one for the uh, position of the head and neck, one for the position and movement of the eyes in space, and then finally one connecting to the cerebellum uh, for fine tuning of movements. So understanding these parts particular uh, tracks and systems within the central nervous system helps us better understand why it is that people with some of these central nervous system problems can develop dizziness. So, of course, any time that somebody has sudden onset dizziness, always our worry is whether or not somebody has a stroke or a bleed, for example, in their cerebellum or within their brainstem. Um, generally speaking, if somebody has dizziness in these locations, uh, more often than not, it is common for them to have other neurological complaints. I think it's a little bit beyond this lecture to go over all of the other tracts that move through uh, the brainstem as there is a substantial number of them. And so I think it's just worth noting as a pearl, if you get a call from one of your patients who is complaining of sudden onset dizziness, there's at least five major symptoms you want to ask them about. Do they have double vision? Do they have any somatosensory changes, particularly on one side of their body? Do they have any weakness on one side of their body? Do they have any slurred speech? Or do they have any incoordination of movements? If a patient says yes to any of these questions, this should be uh, an emergency until proven otherwise, and they should go to the emergency department if they are complaining of sudden onset dizziness. If it is a family member who is calling you about the patient, then there's a sixth question that you should ask, which is, does the patient exhibit any impaired consciousness, which is of course an emergency. We have three example images here. We have a CT in which this bright spot here in the middle of the ponds is a bleed. We have a um, diffusion weighted MRI image here that demonstrates a stroke in the left ponds. Of course, with these images, left is right and right is left. And then here, this is somebody who probably doesn't have a sudden onset dizziness, but perhaps has a slowly progressive dizziness, who I'm guessing has developed some of these other symptoms, uh, who actually has a large uh, vestibular schwannoma is what, what it turned out this was. There's a couple other structures that I just want to make you aware of in the brainstem itself. My apologies, my camera's cutting off here. Uh, the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, which I will now refer to as NPH, and the interstitial nucleus of Kajal, or the INC. I'm just going to move this back. Um, the NPH is largely responsible for horizontal gaze holding. It's located kind of within this pontomedullary junction area. The INC is largely responsible for vertical gaze holding. Um, by the way, both of these are a little bit of oversimplifications of what these are and what they do, but it, they're good rules of thumb. You may hear us kind of refer to something called the neural integrator, um, which is largely responsible for holding the eyes steady such that when I look right, look left or up, and down, I'm able to keep my eyes in those, position, in those positions without uh, any kind of nystagmus or slip of the eyes themselves. 
um, it's these two structures as well as the vestibular nuclei and the vestibulocerebellum that are largely responsible for our eyes being able to hold a steady gaze. And so if anybody has a lesion in any of these areas, whether that's a stroke, a tumor, or something else, then they'll often not be able to hold their eyes steady. And this is why the ocular exam of these patients becomes so important for figuring out what the problem is. So it's important to realize that if somebody has a, has a lesion in any of these areas, then they might have nystagmus and they might complain of vertigo. The details of what type of nystagmus I'm going to defer to for, for future lectures. Another thing to point out is that it's not just individual lesions of these areas, but certain toxins that can also affect these various structures. So for example, if you have patients on certain anti-epileptic drugs or anti-seizure drugs or lithium for, to just give one other example, that might impair the ability of these structures to work as they normally would. And you'll notice that patients who take these medications may have um, problems with holding a steady gaze, especially in eccentric gaze. Moving on to the cerebellum itself. The cerebellum is largely responsible for trunk control, posture, gait, and coordination of movements in general. Uh, on the exam, a lot of times what we end up looking for is ataxia or dysmetria, um, basically problems with coordination of movements, problems with the rhythm of movements. It's actually the intermediate hemisphere located here that's responsible for our arm and leg movements and a problem of the intermediate hemisphere is what can lead to an ataxia on finger nose finger testing, for example. Whereas the lateral hemisphere is more higher order motor planning of the extremities and is responsible for some cognition. Although that's kind of difficult to test for clinically, quite frankly. The vermis or the central portion of the cerebellum is largely responsible for trunk control and somebody who has a problem with the vermis of the cerebellum, you may notice that if you just have them sit, then they kind of sway and can't really keep steady control of their trunk. Um, now there is various parts of the vestibulo cerebellum or parts in which the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellum regularly send signals back and forth to each other that is primarily responsible for equilibrium and balance. Um, it's not difficult to imagine that all of these functions are kind of interrelated. So the inferior vermis itself, as well as, well as the flocculonodular lobes are responsible for regulating balance and eye movements. So once again, the eye movements end up being a very important of the part of the exam to figure out if there are lesions within these areas. And of course, um, the next parts are the flocculus and paraflocculus, which are located here. I apologize, I didn't, lo I didn't um, uh, label this area here, but uh, this is the flocculus that are largely responsible for receiving visual inputs and thus can help with the eyes in controlling smooth pursuit eye movements. Um, in other words, kind of making sure that the eyes move uh, fluidly. So there's many lesions of the cerebellum that can lead to eye problems or um, these complaints of dizziness or imbalance. Um, at least in my personal experience, a lot of the time it's more imbalance that people tend to complain about rather than dizziness. Um, you can have people with cerebellar tumors. And then there's other kind of degenerative diseases such as spinocerebellar ataxia, multiple system atrophy uh, that largely affects these areas. You can have some interesting perineoplastic cerebellar disorders um, that not only affect the cerebellum, but the brainstem itself 
um, including the uh, a portion of the brainstem called the superior colliculus, um, in which patients will also get the this opsoclonus, which is another way of saying that the eyes will just dart in every which way in no organized or coordinated fashion. Um, traditionally, we think about the children with neuroblastoma who develop a perineoplastic disorder that ends up looking like this. However, actually just on service, I want to say uh, eight months ago or so, we had somebody who had a perineoplastic uh, cerebellar process from uh, anti-yo antibodies that had uh, the similar eye movement problem actually. Of course, there are toxins that can also lead to this and then infections of the cerebellum that can also lead to uh, similar complaints. Um, if you have somebody who has been drinking alcohol every day of their life for quite a lot of time, then it's possible that their cerebellum may actually look like this. Uh, in this particular example, this is actually somebody who has had seizures for all their life and they've been on phenytoin for decades. Unfortunately, can also have that as a side effect. So finally, we want to move on to the thalamus, the basal ganglia, and the cerebrum. Um, circled here is the thalamus. So once again, the thalamus is the relay center of the brain, uh, where most of the signals from the brainstem move up through before going to the rest of the cortex. The basal ganglia is kind of the surrounding structures, and uh, it uh, leads to some modification of the information that's received by the thalamus. And then the cerebrum, which houses the vestibular cortex itself, um, that ultimately is more for higher order understanding of where we are in space. So starting with the thalamus here, the thalamus is basically two egg-shaped structures that are on top on either side of the midbrain. Um, the, once again, it's kind of the relay center for the brain. Most signals that go from the brain into the brainstem or from the brainstem into the brain move through the thalamus. And so one interesting rule of thumb that neurologists have when they think about problems of the thalamus itself is that any, any problem with the brain can be mimicked by as a problem in the thalamus. So in other words, if you get a stroke in the thalamus, for example, if it's at the right location, it can look like uh, any, almost any other kind of stroke from any other part of the brain. And one interesting problem uh, that, of course, has been documented in literature is that Patients who have a stroke of the thalamus can develop this thalamic astasia, where they have an ocular tilt reaction. They perceive this kind of um, rotational motion, uh, which is typically something that you might think more from a midbrain lesion. But people who have a thalamic stroke or hemorrhage can get the same sort of thing. So certainly that's something to think about. Next is the basal ganglia, which is kind of, uh, it's kind of outside of the thalamus, uh, above, below, on either side. It consists of several structures. It consists of the caudate nucleus, which is kind of this long snake-like structure around here. The globus pallidus, which, it, which is located um, kind of more just laterally to the thalamus here. It's, the, it's represented by these uh, purple blobs here. And the um, putamen is this area here that's outside of these purple blobs. Um, and then finally, we've got the amygdala, which is of course located down here in the temporal lobe. And the um, nucleus accumbens and substantia nigra down here. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of functions of the basal ganglia, really, and usually when we think about problems with the basal ganglia, we think about 
people who have various movement disorders. Um, it's responsible for the control and regulation of voluntary motor movements, procedural, procedural learning, habit formation, cognition, emotion, as well as eye movements. And so people with uh, lesions of the basal ganglia will get certain classic types of eye movement abnormalities. Uh, beyond just eye movement ab abnormalities, sort of one of the classic um, diseases that we think of the basal ganglia is Parkinson's disease, in which there's a degeneration of the uh, nigrostriatal neurons within um, the substantia nigra. Uh, and of course, pr uh, progressive supranuclear palsy as well as a kind of similar disease process. Um, both of these patients will actually complain of imbalance in which they actually are not able to uh, always walk properly without kind of noticing that they're falling over backwards. And this is known as postural instability. Um, presumably these are, pro these are problems within the basal ganglia or substantia nigra. Um, I actually went on an extensive uh, literature search to try to figure out exactly where postural instability localizes, and it's quite difficult, but um, or quite difficult to figure out where that is. But these patients will complain of imbalance, and you'll notice that you actually can't, uh, that they, they can't seem to maintain their posture at all times and will spontaneously fall backwards. Um, and so anytime that you get somebody who has uh, this sort of problem, um, you want to think about whether or not they have Parkinson's disease or, or ESP. So finally, we're moving on to the vestibular cortex. This is the part of the vestibular system that integrates the information about your location in space and movement uh, for higher order understanding. And we actually think that it is located bilaterally on either side of the brain, but that it's primarily your non-dominant hemisphere or right side that is uh, that uh, processes more of the vestibular information. And so this is known as the parieto-insular vestibular cortex. Um, and basically you can see it's kind of located within this part of the brain where you've got your parietal lobe here, your frontal lobe here, your temporal lobe here, and it's kind of tucked into this um, structure here for the most part. Um, this, this part in here is known as the insular cortex, um, and we believe that the vestibular cortex is located within here while also uh, kind, of be, kind of being uh, within parts of the frontoparietal area here and the superior temporal gyrus here. You may have heard that hearing is in Heschel's gyrus, which is actually located on the right side of the brain approximately here. It's on the superior temporal lobe in the posterior portion. Uh, and we think that the vestibular cortex is kind of located right around that in the same way that the cochlea and the labyrinth are located close together it seems like as though both of them are located in similar spots within the cortex itself. There's one other area of the brain I just wanted to make you aware of, which is the parietal lobe, and that's responsible for sensory integration. And so uh, the reason why this is important is because people who have problems with their parietal lobe can get alterations in motion perception. Um, and this becomes relevant in certain diseases of the cortex itself, um, whether somebody has a stroke there or a tumor there or something else that's going on. So just a few examples of things to think of to keep this, you know, kind of clinically relevant here is that vestibular migraine uh, ends up being a very uh, common problem and uh, our theory of how migraine works is this sort of spreading cortical depression. And so there's this question of, 
you know, is the vestibular cortex affected? And this is why so many people with uh, migraine get dizziness or vertigo. Or is the bridal cortex affected and they're, they have this hypersensitive motion perception? Um, any of these are kind of possibilities of why uh, vestibular migraine leads to these symptoms. Um, another thing, uh, this is a bit rarer, but you can have people who have episodic dizziness that's associated with sensory and motor symptoms, especially positive symptoms such as shaking or um, uh, things along those lines, they might uh, actually have seizures. Of course, you should probably get the whole story that it is associated with these other symptoms because uh, seizures that would only lead to dizziness would be highly unusual. Um, never say never, I guess. Uh, if people are dizzy following a brain injury, certainly think about concussion. Um, and we believe that there's probably some micro tearing of the axons themselves. Um, and presumably it's possible that by micro tearing some of the areas of the uh, cerebrum, they might have a mixed kind of signals moving uh, from the brainstem through the thalamus into the vestibular cortex. And this could be why patients such as this uh, experience dizziness after an accident. One thing to point out is that um, vestibular migraine is actually one of the most common causes of spontaneous episodic vertigo. And so don't discount the vestibular cortex or parietal lobe um, as one of the areas that is the origin of patient's vestibular symptoms. Anyway, these are my references um, for some of these pictures and some of this information. And then uh, a variety of the pictures that I have in this PowerPoint, uh, here are some of the, the websites in which I got these from. Um, thank you for listening. I hope that's just giving you kind of this overview of the anatomy and the physiology of how these things work was helpful. Uh, I know that was a lot of information, but the idea is it's just, it's just a roadmap. It's just these are the areas where you can have problems within the central nervous system. And um, these are just a few examples of problems that you can have and why this ends up being clinically relevant. I think upcoming within the, within the next uh, 11 lectures or so, we'll go over in more detail um, how you can figure out whether or not there is a problem with one of these other structures. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Hello, uh, thank you very much for everything. Um, right now, uh, well, we need to give an apologize because uh, we didn't uh, share the video with the subtitles, but uh, in the chat so will be available uh, for everyone. Uh, and the subtitles will be in uh, several language. Uh, the subtitle were review in English and Spanish and also with the link uh, will be available in over 100 languages, okay? So uh, right now we are going to give the, the word to Dr. Erika Salis. Please authorize your uh, video, your audio, sorry, okay? And Dr. Eloisa, and they are the moderators of the lectures, okay? Eloisa, please. Okay. Right. Uh, and uh, now you can manage the, the, the questions and doubts. Please go ahead, Erika. Okay. Thank you so very much. Good morning, Dr. Gold, Dr. Hack. Uh, I love the lecture. I think it's very practical. Um, we have many people from all over Latin America. We have people from Brazil, Venezuela, Honduras, uh, Mexico. And we're very pleased that we have all over almost 400 people here in this lecture. 
So we're very proud of that. Um, there are not still so many questions here at the chat. Uh, I will ask anyone in the public that would like to make a question, please uh, open your videos and, and your audios. If, um, if there is no questions, I will go further and ask some questions. Um, we have a pathology group, um, central pathology group here at Heno, and we have um, several meetings before this meeting. So in order to be more aware of all the central pathologies that are in the, um, are, are prevalent in the in patients. Uh, and we were very, um, like we have many doubts on thalam thalamic stasia. I don't know if you can uh, further uh, the concept of thalamic stasia. We couldn't really get to it. Um, I don't know if you would like to further um, answer or define this pathology, if you will be so kind, Dr. Gold, Dr. Hag, whomever you decide. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So thalamic astasia, um, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a mystery to me why it happens, mm -hmm. but the because the thalamus basically interacts with so much of the cortex and so much of the brainstem, mm -hmm. it's, you know, theoretically possible that the reason why this entity happens is because it has interactions perhaps with the, um, you know, the interstitial nucleus of Kajal, uh, where there's this connection between the two of them that is responsible for how you perceive um, uh, basically the environment in a, in a 3D space. Um, and if this connection is broken, that people t have a tendency to get this ocular tilt reaction mm -hmm. um, where they kind of see the world as kind of moving towards the side. Okay. Um, the exact details of why it's tilting, to be honest with you, I don't know that I fully understand. Um, mm -hmm. It's just something that's been well described in stroke literature, especially mm -hmm. uh, where people who have strokes in the thalamus have, can get this entity. So they do feel that the, the, the surrounding the environment is moving, is moving. And they do have, I think they do have skew deviation also. Generally speaking, uh -huh. yes. Okay, um, and I would like to ask another question if you let me. Um, I have had like two patients with uh, mega or enlarged cisterna magna. I don't know if that's the right form to, to say it. Mm -hmm. And both of these patients had um, dizziness, but I didn't know if this enlarged cisterna magna will be um, part of the dizziness or just an incidental finding. Um, I looked it up and some um, papers will say, no, nothing to do, it's a tough finding. And the other, other ones will even say that it will have cognitive uh, impairments. I don't know if you have any experience with that. Yeah, so generally speaking, when I see um, large cisterna magnas, I think it's more of a congenital thing and that they probably had those their whole life. And so I think it's less likely that that's actually the cause of their symptoms. However, it wouldn't surprise me if a large enough cisterna magna actually did lead to cognitive deficits, perhaps because of a um, lack of adequate um, kind of development of the um, cerebellum. And the reason for that is because the lateral portions of the cerebellum are known to be mm -hmm. uh, somewhat involved in cognition. So okay. that might not surprise me, but as far as dizziness goes, I, I, I bet that there would be a different cause to be honest. Perfect, thank you. Um, I don't know, Dr. Toledo or someone, I don't know, I think there's some questions on in the chat. Yes, I, want to... I want to thank you both, both of you. Lecture was Excellent, very nice, and very great overview of the central nervous systems and its influence in vestibular disorders. I want to ask you, how could you explain C-zone nystagmus? 
Or can I explain what type of nystagmus? Seesaw nystagmus. Seesaw. Seesaw. Um, so if it's okay with you, I think that seesaw nystagmus is something I'd like to defer to a future lecture because I think that's actually going to be specifically one of the topics um, of a future lecture where you'll get a much broader and more detailed overview of that. Um, but we can see that in certain uh, cerebellar lesions. <laughs> okay, and I have another question. What value do you give to oculomotor alterations as an early sign of PSP? Uh, so the question is um, about PSP. Uh -huh. And oculomotor disorders. Uh -huh. So is the question, why is it that you get certain ocular motor disorders with PSP? Yes, if it is a, could be an early sign of PSP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, it, it, so that is an early sign of PSP, of most types of PSP. The most common type of oculomotor abnormality that you get is that you don't have um, much vertical gaze. Um, these patients have a difficulty looking up. Um, and one easy way to test for this is to use um, opto, like, is to have an optokinetic strip that you move across and see how their eyes kind of move. I think probably one of the theories as to why this is, is because PSP patients get atrophy of their midbrain and it's within the midbrain, um, for example, that you've got your um, INC, which can be responsible for some vertical eye movements. And so if that atrophies in this particular degenerative disease process, then patients have difficulty um, with eye movements, honestly, in general, but especially vertical eye movements. And I think that's kind of, generally speaking, where the problem is and why people have that problem. Okay, another question. Um, you know the mechanisms by um, lithium could affect vestibular nucleus? Do I know the, uh, I'm sorry? The, the lithium, lithium, mm -hmm. um, the medication lithium affects the, the affect the cerebellum. Yeah, do I, yeah, I, to be honest with you, I don't know why, <laughs> quite frankly. But they, uh, but I mean that, I think the question goes to um, if the lithium, um, when people at, um, develop dizziness, the lithium, mm -hmm. it's, a, it could be an intoxication of lithium. But that, may, that could be uh, like uh, down regulating the uh, central nervous system, do you think? Or it could be just intoxication or? Yeah, I think it, I think it probably actually does. Chron so chronic lithium use can lead to some damage to certain parts of the central nervous system. Acute intoxication mm -hmm. uh, can certainly uh, kind of affect some of the connections uh, between the brainstem and the cerebellum is probably the explanation for why people with lithium toxicity get this mm -hmm. crazy kind of uh, 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 end gaze changing nystagmus and can feel very, very dizzy. Um, I don't know the exact mechanism though. I'm not, I'm, it's, that mm -hmm. part is something that I would have to read to be honest. Um, Dr. Toledo, I would like to uh, make a space for the Central Pathology Group of Enolatam. I don't know if any of you that are connected right now uh, want to have uh, an interaction with the speakers. Yeah. I, uh, um, sorry, Erica. Uh, yes. If you open the participant area, uh, you can see uh, there are two people that want to uh, talk. Okay. Yes. Okay. That, that's I'm true. Okay, I'm going to give the word to Dr. Thank you. Justiniano, Justiniano Sea. Okay, in order he can do the question, please, uh, Justiniano, open your audio, please. Okay, go okay. ahead. Okay, sí. Hello, everybody. Este, congratulations, Dr. Nicolás Hack. I have a question about intertricial nucleus of Cajal. We know intertricial nucleus of Cajal uh, have two principal functions. 
vertical gaze holding and torsional gaze holding. Would you explain when I have one side, for, for example, inter only interstitial nuclear of Cajal lesion without a right MLF lesion, only interstitial nuclear of Cajal lesion, what do you find in some patient? Talking about torsional gaze holding only. Um, so if, is your question kind of like, if you have a lesion of that, so for example, if I had a stroke of that area, um, is your question, what would you kind of expect to see? Or is the question more um, about um, why is it that, uh, or, or is your question more like, what is it primarily responsible for? For example, my question is about how do you evaluate torsional gaze holding in that patient? For example, if, if, some, if that patient have left, uh, left interstitial nuclear of Cajal lesion. Oh, ooh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if it's just one of them as opposed to both of them, yeah. That's a good question. To be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure. I think that's something that I'd have to, I'd have to read about that. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, someone put uh, the hand up, but I don't know. I can find. Uh, please. Uh, okay. It was. It okay. was Ca Carlos Palomino. Carlos Palomino okay. uh, raised okay. his hand. First, Jose Bamondes, and after Carlos Palomino. Okay. Uh -huh. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna try it in English. Um, it was a beautiful ponens. Uh, the, I, I have a two question, but Dr. Justiniano eh, se adelantó. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first was related about the gaze holding torsional because I don't really, really know if uh, in, uh, interstitial nucleus of Cajal is the, uh, is the one that is in charge about gaze holding torsional. Is it really that or is mixed with a uh, prepositus hypoglossy, that's one, sorry uh, about my not appropriate English. And the second, which, uh, which is more interesting for me, it's about the velocity storage mechanism. I don't know if this uh, on the next lecture or if you can explain how uh, it is, is, is it works, because uh, that can distinguish be between tilt and gravity and can perseverate in the board because that gives us maybe <laughs> it's for next lecture. That is the question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 second question, I think that I will defer to future lecture because that's a very complex topic and it's difficult for me to just answer that um, kind of off the cuff here. Uh, uh, but I I think that's something that will be brought up uh, later. The, regarding your first question, I do think that the, um, the interstitial nucleus of Cajal does have some, uh, I mean, I, my understanding is that it does have some uh, uh, torsional kind of control mechanisms there. Um, its primary function is kind of the vertical gaze holding, whereas the nucleus propositus is more so uh, the horizontal gaze holding. They, you know, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, I would imagine these, this is one of these things that's a little bit hard to study because how do you, you know, how do you really just get a lesion that's perfectly hitting kind of these nuclei and you're not hitting any of the tracts around it. Um, and there's kind of all these uh, kind of complex uh, connections between them. Um, as far as the details of each of these, uh, of the types of nystagmus that we can see with lesions of each of these nuclei, I actually was just looking at uh, our future lecture series and I do see that this is something that will be explained in much more detail uh, later on. And I, I fear I can't do it justice by just sitting here and trying to talk about such a complex uh, uh, topic here. Uh, so I will defer a little bit of that to later. Right, and I can chime in a little bit. So velocity storage, absolutely. We'll discuss um, in greater depth uh, later on. 
And um, with regard to a, a patient who just has a unilateral interstitial nucleus of Cajal stroke, uh, and I do have examples of all these in my collection. Um, so <laughs> unilateral rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome, a unilateral interstitial nucleus of Cajal syndrome. So what happens if you have a unilateral INC stroke is that there will be usually a pretty large ocular tilt reaction with, with a hypertropia due to a skew deviation and a big head tilt and a big ocular counter roll. Mm -hmm. And because of, its, um, because of its role in vertical and torsional gaze holding, oftentimes you will see a gaze evoke nystagmus and up gaze and in down gaze. So you'll see mm -hmm. up beating nystagmus and up gaze because you can't keep the eyes up they will constantly sort of um, uh, with the, the elastic forces of the orbits be brought back to center. That generates the slow phase and the fast phase is upward. So upbeat and up gaze and downbeat and down gaze in addition to the ocular tilt reaction. The other interesting thing that you'll usually see with an acute INC lesion is because it not only has a role in vertical gaze holding but also torsional gaze holding is that you can see a spontaneous torsional nystagmus. And so if you have a right INC lesion, sorry, I'm getting very confused because I flipped my screen, I mirrored it because Johns Hopkins Hospital in the background was backwards. So now I'm saying right, but everything is the opposite. Um, but if you have a, a right INC lesion, um, the eyes are sort of constantly drifting in the opposite direction and will go back to the right side. Think of it sort of as a, a gaze evoked nystagmus from a, a nucleus propositive hypoglossi the eyes are constantly coming back to center. That's the slow phase and there's the fast phase. Mm. It's the same kind of thing. So there's going to be a spontaneous torsional nystagmus that's gonna to be toward the mm -hmm. side of the lesion as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, as, as you mentioned, it's hard to just take out a unilateral INC without affecting other, other neighboring structures or oftentimes it can be bilateral as well. I'll leave it at that. Um, so So, Dr. Hatch covered a lot, um, which was great. And we're gonna, th these themes are going to repeat. And yeah. repetition is really the best way to learn these concepts, um, which, which are very challenging. Um, and so by hearing this repeatedly and hearing different people um, sort of uh, repeat things in, in slightly different ways, uh, I think hopefully this will help to reinforce these concepts so that by the end, things will make, make sense. And, and basically we're gonna spend a lot of time on the brain stem and cerebellum, a little bit less time on, on the thalamus and basal ganglia and the cerebrum, but there is um, later in the year, an entire talk, an entire 60 minutes dedicated to just that as well. So again, this is a dynamic lecture series. Please give feedback. Um, we, we are absolutely happy to sort of alter things and, and, and accommodate and uh, again, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So we want, we want this to, to be beneficial for many people. And um, so please, please give us feedback. Okay, we are going to give the, the word to Carlos Palomino. Please go ahead, Carlos, with your question. Activate your audio, please. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gold, for your uh, website, or for your recordings and lectures. I use it. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hack, for your presentation. My question was about the uh, questions before, and I, 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 I was wondering if, if there is uh, uh, this different type of nystagmus of uh, lesions of nucleus prepositus hypoglossy than, uh, than, nucleo, uh, than vestibular nuclei isolated, if there is a different type of nystagmus between those, er those areas isolated. And the second was about the uh, esthetiotalamic you talked. And if it is quite similar than uh, the pusher syndrome that we, we, we saw in the, we, we, we see in the, in the thalamic stroke, for example, or cerebral lesions, for example, if it is the same or quite similar. So for the, the second question, um, yeah, it's pretty much the same idea because the whole pusher, the whole pusher syndrome is, you know, if you if you feel as though the whole world is kind of tilting around you, then 
Um, I think that that name kind of came from the fact that patients feel like as though they're being pushed over. So um, it's, it's kind of the, the same idea. Regarding your first question, uh, yes, the nystagmus ends up being different for different parts of the vestibular nuclei. Um, once again, though, I feel like the details, the details of that are, are also going to be gone over uh, in more detail, I think, in the future lectures, especially when we talk about the brainstem. Um, Dr. Gold, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to kind of say about that. Yeah, I guess I would say that, that um, as you stated before, the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, the NPH, is primarily responsible for horizontal gaze holding but it's sort of part of a complex. Now that complex includes the medial vestibular nucleus as well. So the MVN, the medial vestibular nucleus and the NPH are responsible for, for horizontal gaze holding. So if you have bilateral lesions of those complexes, then you're gonna have sort of symmetric bilateral gaze evoked nystagmus horizontally. If you have a stroke that affects one complex, that affects one side that causes an NPH or an MVN or an NPH and MVN stroke, then you're gonna have a little bit more gaze evoked toward the side of the stroke, but you will still see some gaze evoked in the opposite direction. So there is localizing value um, with regard to the different patterns of nystagmus, depending on sort of where you are in the brainstem. And then if you, if you affect the, the superior vestibular nucleus, for instance, which projects the anterior canal pathways, then you're gonna have a completely different pattern of nystagmus with an upbeat torsional nystagmus. So it, it absolutely, um, the, the specific subnucleus um, can really have good localizing value. And um, that's why neurology is so fun. That's what attracted me to eye movements is that um, you can really localize to a very small part of the brain or the brain stem with a good comprehensive um, examination. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Erica, there is a question. Yes, yes, a question on YouTube. Yes. If you let me another question. Um, one question is, how does function of each vestibular nucleus uh, differ? I think part that it was part of the lecture also, uh, Dr. Hack mentioned. I don't know, you would like to mention a little bit more about each vestibular nucleus? Yeah, I mean, I can kind of briefly go over that. So. Each vestibular nucleus um, projects uh, different tracks to different parts of the uh, brain and spinal cord. So to give an example, like the lateral vestibular nucleus is mm -hmm. the one that projects the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Um, mm -hmm. But then it also, in combination with the medial vestibular nucleus, uh, mm -hmm. projects information on the medial vestibulospinal tract. And just as a reminder, it's the lateral vestibulospinal tract that is responsible for maintaining balance and tone. And it is the uh, medial vestibular vestibulospinal tract that's more for like uh, your head and neck position. Mm -hmm. um, it's the primarily the superior vestibular nucleus that's more responsible for projecting to um, the medial longitudinal fasciculus or MLF. However, that also gets projections from uh, both the uh, medial or the, the superior vestibular nucleus with the medial vestibular nucleus with the inferior vestibular nucleus all have projections to the MLF. Um, and then uh, and, and then I think it's actually virtually, I think it's actually at least parts of virtually all of them that are responsible for projecting to the uh, vestibulocerebellar tract, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but, you know, basically because each vestibular nucleus gets different signals from kind of different canals and that sort of thing, uh, this is how your uh, brain kind of separates out these signals and sends them to the appropriate tracts Mm -hmm. so that you can maintain proper eye function, proper tone in your body, proper posture of your head and neck, and all of these types of things that become very important for um, as, as functions, as secondary functions to, your, to the sensory information you get from your vestibular system. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eloisa. 
I don't know, you have more questions or comments? We have two questions. One is, which is the area of the brain more concerned about cognitive recognition? Yeah, so uh, cognition is a very broad topic. And to be honest with you, virtually every part of the brain is at least somewhat responsible for uh, cognition. Cognition is mostly held within the cortex itself. And so that includes, that includes, the, it includes the frontal lobe, it includes the parietal lobe, it includes uh, at least parts of uh, the occipital lobe and temporal lobe. It's perhaps mostly in the frontal lobe. And so anytime that a neurologist does uh, cognitive testing that ends up being the predominant lobe that they're testing for, However, your parietal cortex has some visual spatial uh, information um, that's a, part, a key part of cognition. Your temporal lobe has some um, memory formation type of uh, in information that all is considered part of your cognition. And then I had mentioned in my lecture that the lateral cerebellum actually does have some cognitive uh, control. Um, although this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know that we've found out a good way to test this at the bedside. Um, so that's kind of a general overview and cognition itself could be an entire, could be an entire separate lecture, to be honest. Well, another question is, after caloric test, we expect that ocular fixation inhibits the nystagmus, but instead of this, if the nystagmus assume a torsional component, what do you think about a vestibular nucleus lesion or in another side? Mm. Well, this is one that I have to think about actually. That's a really good question. So, so I can help out. So I guess I would yeah. say, so for instance, um, so why, why do we remove fixation? Why do we use Frenzel goggles or, or infrared video Frenzels? Uh, we use it because we know that with vestibular nystagmus, it's going to accentuate the nystagmus. It's going to make it um, more prominent and more and easier to appreciate. Um, that being said, there's there's less of a, a decrease in the nystagmus with fixation for torsional nystagmus. There's you're, you're going to to decrease with fixation um, a a horizontal component more than the torsional component. So for instance, if you don't use Frenzel goggles and you, somebody has BPPV and you see the upbeat torsional nystagmus, if they're staring right at your nose, you might see what looks like more torsional than sort of the upbeat component because the upbeat component, the vertical component can be suppressed, but the torsional component can't be as well, is not as well suppressed. So anytime you see pure torsional nystagmus, absolutely, you're, you're thinking central, central, and more central, because in order to have pure torsional nystagmus on a peripheral basis, um, which can happen, uh, but it's hard to do because you have to strategically take out this semicircular canal and strategically take out this semicircular canal, because everything is so condensed um, as at the level of the brainstem it's much easier to, to have pure torsional nystagmus due to a brainstem lesion, for instance. So you should absolutely assume that a pure torsional nystagmus is central until proven otherwise. Okay. okay. Um, another question. And uh, could you talk a little bit about early signs of instability or imbalance in Parkinson's disease patient? Yeah. Um, so, Parkinson's disease patients, um, the, early, the earliest things that people will complain about is just, um, it's, it's generally pretty vague to be honest. They'll just feel as though they'll have kind of some sort of imbalance and uh, you always, and if they've had falls with this imbalance, what you wanna ask them is how is it that they have fallen? Because if somebody is falling backwards, that's a little bit of a red flag uh, that, that this could be a postural instability problem rather than something else. Because there's all kinds of things that can cause falls, musculoskeletal problems, joint problems, um, or just, you know, stepping on an uneven surface type of thing. So 
you always want to ask if they've been falling backwards, and that might be a sign of postural instability um, as something that's going on. If the question is more what happens or what happens if you get somebody who has early postural instability um, in early in the sign of Parkinson's, then that's a red flag that maybe they have PSP. However, the caveat to this is that there is variants on Parkinson's disease that have early postural instability that are not PSP. Um, and uh, that tends to be a, tends to herald a little bit of a worse prognosis in these sorts of patients. Did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Erika? Thank uh, you, yes. Um, I can think Justiniano wants to talk. I'm, I'm not sure if he I'm going to give you his hand. Uh -huh. yes. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Hello, this question is about your experience. And how often do you find ocular tear reaction in peripheral vestibular neuritis, for example, for both? I can answer that. Yes, Dan, Dan is so. smiling because we so. know, we know, we know he's studying this topic. Yeah. We always oh. do the same question. Uh, I'd like to let you know, uh, Nicholas and Dan, that this question has been repeated at least three or four times <laughs> during the last three months. So we, 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 are, we are waiting for it. And we have uh, very specific questions, okay? So go ahead, please, uh, Dan, with this question. Okay, can I share my screen? Okay, for sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so the reason I want to share my screen is because I just wrote a paper about this. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? So, so yeah. this is Hintz exam in acute vestibular neuritis. Do not look too hard for the skew. Um, so this is in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology. It just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, it looks like it's been tweeted by five people so far. So that's good. That's a good start. Um, so this this paper tackles that question and, and hopefully does a good job of addressing it and answering it. Um, I'll stop sharing now. But basically, 100% of the patients I've seen with an acute vestibular neuritis in the first 24, 48, 72 hours, if you look hard enough, I've found that they have a skew, not with the test of skew, but if you use a Maddox rod, um, if, if, some, if there's, or there are people out there who've never heard of a Maddox rod, I suspect there are. In my collection, there's a tutorial on how to use a Maddox rod. Um, so you can go out and buy one. It's 20 or 30 American dollars. But it's a, it's a way to appreciate very small ocular misalignments, especially vertical ocular misalignments. And we took uh, consecutively examined seven or eight or nine patients with acute vestibular neuritis, and we found that all of them had, in the emergency department, a little bit of a head tilt. They had a little bit of a skew, a teeny tiny skew that we could not appreciate with even alternate cover testing, it was so small. And when we did fundus photos, we saw that the eyes were actually rolled. There was an ocular counter roll. When we use the bucket test to evaluate for a subjective visual vertical, all of them had a perceptual tilt in their SVV as well. So everybody had a complete ocular tilt reaction, but it was really subtle and it went away really quickly. And patients um, should not have double vision because of that teeny tiny, that mini skew. That being said, there are patients out there who have acute vestibular neuritis and have a measurable, with the, the, the test of skew, a measurable vertical misalignment who are complaining of vertical diplopia. You should assume that that's central until proven otherwise, but I have seen three patients in the last seven years who have had a measurable skew causing vertical diplopia due to acute vestibular neuritis, um, but you have to be careful in diagnosing that and you have, have to make sure that you've ruled out a, a dangerous or a central cause first. Okay, Do thank you so much. Dr. Gold, and what about the central vestibular and pseudoneuritis? Do you have had patients with pseudoneuritis with a central component? Central, I'm central vestibular pseudoneuritis. I'm sorry, what was the word before neuritis? Uh, central vestibular. Vestibular? 
so so a vestibular neuritis uh -huh. a pseudo pseudo neuritis o p s u d o pseudo a pseudo neuritis oh pseudo yes. oh sorry okay pseudo neuritis uh -huh. so i'm not I'm not sure I understand what pseudo vestibular pseudo neuritis is, unless are you talking about posterior, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery causing a pseudo vestibular neuritis? Yes, stroke or central component causing uh, an horizontal not changing nystagmus, mm -hmm. but looking it's looking like vestibular neuritis, but it's not vestibular neuritis. It's a central component. Right. Had, so uh -huh. yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I had a patient, uh, I talked with my, my colleagues on uh, Central uh, Pathology Group. I had a patient that had an unchanging horizontal nystagmus and um, my resident saw it and thought it was vestibular neuritis. It looked like vestibular neuritis, everything like vestibular neuritis. We, um, we, uh, the patient went to his home and he came back three, four days later. He still had uh, nystagmus very severe nystagmus. And what was interesting is that the mother uh, asked me why his son had hiccups. Hiccups? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He had a severe hiccups. 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 I'm sorry, Got hiccups. It. He had, he had hip hiccups. And when we did uh, an MRI, he had a stroke in uh, medulla. Got it. Medulla stroke. stroke. Right, so the, the, a lateral medullary stroke, a Wallenberg stroke, um, commonly uh -huh. will involve or give somebody hiccups. And because you're talking about the vestibular nucleus, mm -hmm. um, and again, we're talking about the vestibular nerve, then we're talking about the vestibular nucleus. They're just a couple of millimeters away from each other. So you can have um, what looks, something that looks very peripheral, that's in fact central. That's why the Hintz exam is a three-step test and not a one-step test. If we were only relying on the nystagmus, then um, it is absolutely possible to have a stroke that looks exactly like vestibular neuritis, just regarding that unidirectional nystagmus that follows Alexander's law. So then we have to check for the test of skew. We have to see if a skew is present or absent. We have to see um, if the patient has a, a, an abnormal head impulse, and did that patient have an abnormal head impulse? But what about if the nystagmus is so severe? Can you do all those tests? Right. So I, in my experience in the emergency department, and I've done a lot of consults in the emergency department, um, uh -huh. generally speaking, the head impulse test is pretty well tolerated. Generally speaking. Okay. That being said, I would do it last in case mm -hmm. the patient throws up um, and says, you can't, that's it, I'm out of here, um, then you're done already. So I've, in my experience, I've found that even sick people will tolerate a couple of head impulse tests, maybe not more than a couple, but again, if you know that it's right beating nystagmus mm -hmm. and you know that if there's a vestibulopathy, it has to be on the left side, mm -hmm. then they might let you do too. And, and that's enough to prove that there's a left-sided vestibulopathy. Uh, but hiccups is a big red flag, yes. and that's a, a common symptom in a, a Wallenberg, a lateral medullary syndrome, and patients can have difficulty swallowing, they can have a change in their voice, hoarseness as well, they can have sensory loss on one side of the face, they can have ptosis due to Horner syndrome, they can have loss of sensation on the opposite side of the body. So from a neurologic standpoint, um, again, that's, that's why the rest of the neurologic exam is so important. Mm -hmm. um, but, but again, usually in that kind of patient, the Hintz exam will answer mm -hmm. the question, assuming that, that the expert is there in the emergency mm -hmm. department and assuming that the patient can tolerate it. And if they can't tolerate, if you just can't do a head impulse test and there's a chance it could be central, then, then I would evaluate, do the stroke workup and in sort of retrospect, then you can say, you know what, this might've been vestibular neuritis or when they're um, they're, they're doing well enough for you to, to test everything. But if you can't prove that it's peripheral, then I would just assume that it's central. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know, Dr. Toledo, you have another question? Last question. Is there any value for you for saccadic movement in frontal cortex disease, lesion, or in patients with psychiatric disorders? But is the question, uh, 
if you have somebody with a frontal lesion or psychiatric yes. disorders, yes. Psychiatric uh, what, disorders and, and alterations in saccadic movements. Yeah, uh, I think one of the one of the most common things that you might see in somebody with frontal lesions is that they have a lot of saccadic intrusions. They can't give smooth eye movements. Um, I think that's probably kind of one of the most common things that you would see. But because the brainstem is intact, all of their vestibulo ocular reflex should be intact. So if you did like a um, head impulse test, for example, it would be normal in each direction if it's just a frontal lesion. Right. And I guess I would just add to that. Um, so that there are in all of these different neurodegenerative problems and psychiatric disorders, there are all these reports of these very mild saccade and other eye movement abnormalities, but they tend not to be that clinically relevant. That is, if you're seeing the patient in the clinic, um, you're not going to make a diagnosis based on that. Um, one fun test that I like to do for, for sort of cognitive function is so you can check saccades. You can have the patient um, look, at, look at your fingers and say, look at my right finger, and now look back at center and look at my left finger, look back to center. A cognitive test using saccades is something called the anti saccade test, where now I can say, um, so look, look at the finger that's, that's wiggling. I'm sorry, my fingers keep disappearing here. Look at the finger that's wiggling. Look at the finger that's wiggling. Look at the finger that's wiggling. And then say, look at the finger that's not wiggling. So I wiggle this hand and they, look at, they have to look at the other finger. Or I wiggle this hand and they have to look at the other finger. Sorry, I, my, I can't keep my hands here. Um, but, but an anti saccade test is a nice sort of test, a cognitive screen test that you can do quickly and easily by using their eye movements as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, Erika, do you have an extra question? Or yes, um, Dr. Hack, um, I really like your case where you uh, mentioned a patient that, that was febrile and it had meningitis, and you mentioned that dizziness, acute dizziness, febrile, and probably we have to discard meningitis. Um, D was uh, probably a labyrinthitis. Was the patient going through a labyrinthitis because of the severe ne sensory neural hearing loss and vertigo? And what was the treatment of this patient, if you know? Yeah, yeah, so I, I was, uh, no, I was taking care of that, that patient. So, um, I think that at least from what I read, the theory with uh, meningitis is that it actually does direct damage to the um, cochlea and cochlear hair cells itself. And so presumably that's the same sort of thing with the um, vestibule uh, as well, that it damages those hair cells. There's always a, been a part of me that's wondered if because the nerve does move through the subarachnoid space, if perhaps acutely they get cranial nerve deficits because of the subarachnoid involvement mm -hmm. um, of meningitis, mm -hmm. if that could be the uh, mechanism acutely, and then perhaps mm -hmm. the hair cell damage might be later on. Um, yeah, and to be honest with you, at least in the research that I did, it wasn't entirely clear to me which of those two places is the primary localization for early on in the disease process. But we know that uh, diseases of the subarachnoid space can lead to uh, cranial nerve uh, deficits in general, not just of cranial nerve eight. Um, yeah, this was, and so in regarding your second question, um, you know, this is a person who came into the emergency department completely cognitively intact. And so most people wouldn't suspect meningitis in a case like this, but the problem is that you have, a, they are acutely febrile and they're coming in with these new symptoms from a cranial nerve. And so you have to chase that uh, in order to best treat the patient. And the, um, yeah, I remember the white blood cells on that tap were like 500 and 600. It was actually a strep meningitis and the patient was acutely treated with um, vancomycin, ceftriaxone, ampicillin, and acyclovir until we kind of knew what was going on. And luckily it was caught early enough that this patient didn't have much residual deficits. Oh, okay. Uh, they, you didn't do uh, a surgery because when we talk, uh, we ENT doctors, we talk about labyrinthitis. I assume 
probably some patients will have labyrinthitis and then meningitis. Um, sometimes uh, for ENT doctors, we will put a ventilation tube or do a mastoidectomy. That was, I was uh, curious about the, the follow-up of the patient. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the imaging, we, I mean, we did imaging on this patient. There didn't mm -hmm. seem to be any evidence of, um, uh, of an infection there. And so uh, I'm actually not entirely sure why this patient developed meningitis, um, but I don't okay, think that, perfect. I don't necessarily think it was originally coming from there. Thank you. I don't know any one of the central pathology group wanna do one of one, two last questions. I don't know, you can raise your hand, you can open your microphone or you can put, uh, write a question. Okay, Erica, uh, probably, yeah, um, we need to complete the period of uh, question on that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I like to say thanks, uh, Nicolas, for, for the lecture, the wonderful lecture was very, very clear. Uh, also, I want to say thanks to Dan Gold for uh, to be the, the director of this course and for organize everything, all the speakers, okay? And I'd like to say thanks to the support team. Uh, we need uh, to um, uh, make a curve of learning in, uh, uh, in this kind of lectures. There are some new things they need to, to improve, but we are very happy because of the lectures. And uh, I do believe uh, uh, we need to stop uh, with the formal parts. Uh, please, uh, Jose Luis, stop sh sharing uh, YouTube. And we are going to start a little bit in the informal parts. So in this, uh, in this area, uh, I like to mention one thing, one big bit, one bit thing is the uh, Hieno group uh, have a very special sense of humor. Humor is very wonderful for every for everyone here. So uh, I want to tell about uh, a very special uh, thing that Nicolas put in his uh, uh, screen. Nicolas Genofan uh, hack. Okay, <laughs> so it's wonderful to have this kind of sense of humor because uh, we do believe. Uh, our cultures are, are really different, are really different. So that's why uh, we need to interchange to have uh, this kind of a space uh, in order we can have uh, a communication, not all in neurophology, okay? Uh, so uh, I like to, to say thanks and I like to give the word to Nicolas in order he can close the meeting as a traditional. And after I'm going to give the word to Dan in order we can close the, the meeting. Okay, please, uh, Nicolas. Genofan hack, Nicolas Genofan hack. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have too, too much else to say. Just, um, yeah, thanks for doing this. This is actually really cool that we're able to kind of do these these uh, Zoom conferences internationally and share knowledge um, across cultures, um, even you know, even despite this language barrier, um, I just think that this is a very cool thing in general. And it, um, this was a really good opportunity for me. I'm glad that I could have practiced this. You guys ask really good questions. I, I you know, I still have a lot to learn in the future. Um, but yeah, this, I mean, this was a really fun thing. I'm glad that Dan Gold invited me. I'm glad that all of you were here. Um, yeah, that was really fun. Well, we will you, uh, we, we are going to wait you each lectures in the next 12 months. Be sure we are <laughs> going to verify is Nicola Genofan hack is present or not. <laughs> 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 okay, please, Dan, go ahead, please. <laughs> All right, so I just renamed myself um, to, to not be outdone by Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, go right. to your general member. Oh, no, 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 you, you, you should uh, uh, become a general member, okay? okay? Go we ahead. are going to, to fix with our support team. I you appreciate can that. Can, can, you, can you waive the membership fee for me? Uh, can you? Sorry. 
can can you um can can I not have a membership fee? Oh yeah, no, you're going to have your membership. Be sure okay. you're going to have it <laughs> as soon as possible. And uh, Nicholas also. Uh, okay, great. Is going to become a gay. So yeah. I mean, I, I would just say um, again that this the pandemic has been terrible for all of us and has really disrupted us our lives personally and professionally. But the one bright spot has been this: the the ability to easily connect with people from all over the world, people who have similar interests. So um, I've really enjoyed doing these lectures um, all across the world in the last couple of months, and I'm I'm really um, proud to sort of have worked with, with your society to, to come up with this lecture series. And, um, and I really appreciate it. I think hopefully that everyone benefits from this. But like I said, this is a, a dynamic lecture series. Uh, this is our first attempt at it. So please, please give feedback. I look forward to future lectures and to making this even better. Um, Nick, you did a great job. And um, I think this is a, a successful uh, inaugural uh, lecture here. So thank you for, for allowing to, me to be a part of this. Okay, thank you for everyone. We're going to stop on the meeting. I want to request the support team to keep in the meeting, okay? Because we need to, to talk a little bit about how to fix uh, some things. So are only for technical issues, okay? So bye-bye, uh, have a nice day, have a nice Saturday, um, um, take care, okay, um, and everything, okay? Bye-bye, see you. Eh, doctor Pinto, ¿me quedo para sí. comentar? Sí, ¿verdad? Okay. Sí, sí, deberían quedarse. Vamos Aquí estoy, a... sí, no, no hay ningún problema. Ok. Um... Great, great job, everyone. Thanks so much. I have to go. Um, but Jose, Jose will be in touch. Ok, ok. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. You. Ok, bye. Bye, bye. See you. Um, vamos a pedir entonces que se puedan salir todos. Nos tenemos que quedar las seis o siete personas, digamos, de, del grupo de soporte. Por favor, les voy a pedir a todos que se puedan salir porque tenemos que hacer la evaluación ahora, ya, si nos están escuchando. Ok, por favor. Creo que para... sigue en YouTube. Sigue en YouTube, hay que parar la transmisión. Ya la cortó, ya la cortó, ya. No, eh... porque dice live en YouTube aquí arriba. No, no, no. A ver, estoy dando el audio a José Luis. A ver. Yo, yo sigo. Perdón. Sí, lo vas a seguir viendo porque tú eres el host y mientras yo no lo sea, no puedo cortarlo. Por eso te estaba, te estaba pidiendo que, que, que me dieras a mí el host para poder frenar la, la transmisión de YouTube. Ah, vale, vale, vale. vale. Usted tiene vale. que cortarlo, doctor. A ver, espérate. Sí. José, eh, avisaste que nos vemos el próximo mes para la gente que nos está siguiendo en YouTube. Espera, Mónica.